part three of our series of serving two masters and we have covered so much last week we hit on these a couple of these same issues and uh, a couple I'll have one correction like this slide right here um, it was pointed out to me by my lovely wife that I've said the last two weeks that was John 13 it was actually John 12 so that was a typo that I've perpetuated wanted to correct this is a great text about everything we've been talking about uh, not loving our lives on this earth but loving our life forever so the man who loves his life meaning here will lose it while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life and we've talked about whoever serves me must follow me and where I am my servant also will be the question I want to begin with tonight is are we putting the sinful nature to death I really want you, if you have a Bible, to open to Romans 8. That's where we're going to begin tonight. Romans 8, starting in 5. And I have a few Bibles. I'm actually going to start bringing Bibles for people who would like to use a Bible. They're on the table. So don't be afraid at any point if you want to hop up and get a Bible over there. If you want to use your digital Bible, that's great. But if you would like a paper Bible, I'm going to have those and they're also available if you don't have a Bible at home and you want one or if you like one of those and you would like and like to use it, carry it to work because it's small, take one. That'd be awesome. J Romans 8, starting in verse 5. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. If you recall, when we started in Colossians, the very first weapon that I gave you for fighting the worldly nature was setting your mind on things above, not on earthly things or not on worldly things. So Paul's picking up the same idea here in Romans 8. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. So if you live according to the sinful nature, you have your mind set on that. But if you live according to the Spirit, you have your mind set on what the Spirit desires. 8.6 the mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. Nine, I'm going to just read through this and we'll talk about it a little bit. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. That's key. The conditional phrase is for the Spirit to be in us. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of, of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live, because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So, are we putting to death the sinful nature? Only by the power of the Spirit. Paul's very clear in 13. It's by the Spirit we put to death the misdeeds of the body. So we cannot go about accomplishing these goals of living more purely or more righteously or more holy or, or any way more like Jesus without the power of the Spirit. The Spirit has to do that. And so what we just read was Romans 8, 5 through 14. 5 through 14. And that was 13 that was just that main point right there. We have to identify the worldliness in our lives. That is the only way we can put it to death. It's your first blank there, I think. Identifying the worldliness in our lives is the only way we can put it to death. The Spirit being the power behind it, but us being able to recognize it and repent from it, being able to see it and call it out in our lives, that's what we're trying to do. That's what these three parts of Serving Two Masters has been all about. About using the Spirit to put to death the misdeeds of the body. So this was the text that we're really hitting on tonight, and I really want you to internalize. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. 
Just like Jesus said, those who want to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life, for me, will find it. And in the same way, Paul is teaching in Romans that if you live for this life, if you live for the sinful nature, you will die eternally. But if by the Spirit, look at what he says, if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. You will live eternally. But see, if you want to take these more literally, you totally can. Because you can talk about how the life now will be abundant. Jesus said, I've come that they may have life and have it abundantly. And if you live according to the sinful nature, it could literally kill you. I mean, that's not something that you have to take figuratively. It can be literal. If you live according to your sinful nature, it could kill you in this world today. I mean, in, in the physical realm, it could kill you. And if we put to death the misdeeds of the body, that's the best life you can live. That's the best life you can live, is when you've put to death the world and crucified the sinful nature and have turned to live for Him. So as we jump back into these areas that I brought up last week, I'm going to be adding on. These are addendums, if you will. And so as we look at money and greed one more time, I'm going to add on the section I skipped last week. I even said in the middle of the sermon, I said, we're going to talk about giving at the end of the section. It took me so long to get through the money section that I just I skipped the giving part somewhat unintentionally and went right on to try to finish the material instead of just sort of taking my time, which I need to do a better job of, of, of doing. So tonight we're going to hit the giving section of, of money and greed, pride. And this, is, this is a tough section. Think about what the Bible says about being rich and Christian. What does the Bible say about being rich and Christian? Because, frankly, if we look at, the, again, the scope of the world, everyone who lives in America, who's above American poverty line, which you know, could be like $19,000, $20,000 a year. I don't know where America draws its poverty lines. But 1% of the world earns more than $36,000 a year. So anyone who earns more than that, which is basically a basic teacher salary, first year in as a teacher, um, you'll make about that much. And when we think about rich, we should think about the people who worldwide are the wealthiest, not the people in America who are the wealthiest, but the people worldwide, because we are part of the world and God looks at all people. So think about these things of what the Bible says about being rich and a Christian. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, he heard the rich man say, I've kept all these commands. Jesus said, one thing you lack, sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. In Luke 18, 22, Jesus meets this rich young ruler. He has the same conversation in Matthew, uh, Matthew 18 or 19, it's right around there. And this rich young ruler walks up to Jesus and says, I've got it all. I mean, I, all I, all I want to know, Jesus, is what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus starts off asking, did you obey all the commandments? He goes, yeah, I have. What do I still lack? He asked Jesus, what do I still lack? And Jesus said, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven. And then Jesus looked at, looked at him and said, in, in Matthew, he says this to his, all of his disciples, but he's saying this to, to those who are around him or listening, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Depending on who you listen to, some people like to say that the, the eye of a needle was this uh, opening in the, in the wall of Jerusalem. There was a small opening that camels could duck down on their arms and on their arms and legs or whatever, or all their legs, and wiggle through this door to get through this hole in the wall of Jerusalem, and they called it the eye of the needle. There's absolutely no verification for this, this idea that's been propagated throughout people teaching it. Uh, for that to be what Jesus is referring to, that we have no evidence that that existed or that that's true at all. 
what we have to understand, or I think what we have to infer from this, is that Jesus is literally referring to a needle. And we're literally refer, inferring or referring to the hole in the top of a needle and a camel going through the eye of a needle. Because he ends this when the apostles, they looked at him and said, who then can be saved? Jesus said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Literally referring to us, to our salvation as rich people. On our own, it is impossible. Only through God changing our hearts and working in our lives and, and leading us out of this wealth-driven mentality, is it possible for rich, the rich to be saved? Luke 12 is a passage I read last week, and I want to hit it one more time because I, I took it in a different direction last week. 12, 16 through 21, you can turn there. Parable of the man who had a good crop. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Hmm, seems like a good idea. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for yourself for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be happy or be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich toward God. A couple of applications here. For one, it's evident from this text that God punished this rich man by ending his life. Okay, this wasn't a man who died of natural causes. Based on the text, this is how it will be means that God ended that man's life. He said, your life will be demanded from you. So God said, your time's up. If that's how you're going to live. It's over. God killed him. Because he was hoarding wealth for himself. Now, how we apply this to ourselves, because this is how it will be with anyone, meaning it transcends time, who stores up things for himself but is not rich toward God, meaning God could at any moment. And who knows that he hasn't just decided to take rich people. Any given moment, just be like, okay, you're done. I mean, that's a sobering thought. I mean, that, that, is, that is a come to Jesus moment where you say, oh, Jesus, help me not be like this rich man. So the application becomes this, but is not rich toward God. Jesus is teaching those who have a lot better give a lot. And when we spend a lot on ourselves, it is easy to forget God. It is easy when we start getting so self-absorbed in the things that we buy and spend on ourselves that we just forget God altogether. Forget to be rich towards Him. What does it mean to be rich toward God? Well, obviously, He's referring to giving. And those who store up a lot for themselves better store up a lot for God. He's saying, if you're going to build bigger barns for yourself, you better be building bigger barns for God, too. So that's one of those things, like what is a rich person supposed to do who has a lot of money? Well, that person is expected by God to be giving a whole lot of money. I would say the people who are the richest should be giving the most money percentage-wise of anyone, and we'll talk about that in a second. Deuteronomy 8 you don't have to turn there. Just listen to this. He says to the Israelites, When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land He has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe His commands, His laws, and His decrees that I am giving you to this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, this sounds like America, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, everybody, that's us, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God 
who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. God prophesied against Israel. Then your heart will become proud. He's like, look, I'm giving you this land. I'm giving you this promised land flowing with milk and honey and all these things you didn't plant, all these buildings you didn't build, all this prosperity you didn't earn. And if you get in this place and you get caught up in it, you will forget me. You will forget me. Let me talk for a second about John Wesley. John Wesley was an amazing man in, in many ways. I want to read just a little bit about him to give you an example of what I believe is probably one of the most biblical views on wealth and money that I've found anywhere. The story goes like this. An event which occurred while Wesley was at Oxford greatly impacted his views on giving. Evidently, after purchasing some pictures for his room, he noticed one cold winter day that one of the chambermaids or servants had nothing to protect her except a thin linen gown. When he reached into his pocket to give her some money to buy a coat, he found he had too little left. Immediately the thought struck him that the Lord was not pleased with the way he had spent his money. He asked himself, will thy master say, well done, good and faithful steward. Thou hast adorned thy walls with the money which might have screened this poor creature from the cold. O oh, justice, O oh, mercy, are not these pictures the blood of this poor maid? From that day in 1731, Wesley determined to maintain his standard of living at the same level and give away everything above that threshold. At that time, with earnings of 30 pounds and living expenses at 28 pounds, he gave away two pounds. When his earnings increased to 60 pounds, double his income, he gave away 32 pounds. As they increased to 120 pounds, he continued to live on 28 and to give away 92 pounds. He became known for his saying, what should rise is not the Christian standard of living, but his standard of giving. He continued this practice his entire life, even when his income reached 1,400 pounds. He lived on 30 pounds. He gave himself a little raise and gave the rest away. Wesley was afraid of laying up treasures on earth, so the money went out in charity as quickly as it came in. He reports that he never had more than 100 pounds at any one time. I look at some modern day people of faith Two names you might be familiar with, Stephen Furtick and Francis Chan. I look at these two men who have walked very similar paths, who both planted churches that became mega churches. Chan planted Cornerstone, which became 5,000 plus in California. And Furtick planted Elevation, which became 25,000 in multi-sites in Charlotte, North Carolina. They both wrote books. Francis Chan's first book called Crazy Love, he got a call from his publisher, and you can watch him tell the story on YouTube. And his publisher told him, this book is about to blow up. It's about to go huge, and you're going to get a windfall. Lots of money is about to come in. Millions. And Francis Chan and his wife Lisa sat down and had a talk, and they said, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And so they decided to sign it all away. Every dollar that came in from Crazy Love went to missions. And his next book, the same. And his next book, can you imagine the work that he put into writing these books and not making anything off of them? Giving them away for free? 
by, via uh, internet through PDF copies to people who needed them for free who couldn't afford to pay for his books, but then selling them strictly to raise money for the poor orphans' missions. Furtick has written about the same number of books as Francis Chan has. Furtick decided to build a $1.6 million home in Charlotte, North Carolina. 7,000, I don't know how many thousand square feet, five bedroom, five and a half bath or something, probably much bigger than that. Anyway, all I know is 1.6 million and it is a monster of a home. And he even said in defense of himself, and you can watch this as well, the, the news in Charlotte has a great segment following Elevation Church and the way they spend their money. There's a segment of, of Spurtick preaching where he says, my house isn't that great. There are other houses that are bigger than mine. And plus, I only used proceeds from my books to build this house. I didn't use any money from the church. Just a comparison of two different people who had similar paths in life and chose two separate ways to live. What John Wesley would say is figure out what you need and give the rest away. Figure out what you need and give the rest away. Paul writes to the Corinthians, on the first day of every week, each of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income. Set aside a sum in keeping with your income sounds like a percentage. He doesn't lay down the tithe. The tithe isn't a New Testament biblical principle. And so 10% isn't a number that we need to take and apply to ourselves and say 10% is the goal. The goal is set aside an amount consistent with your income. And that means the people who make more will set aside more and the people who make less will set aside less. I said last week, I said this, it's not just the money you give, but the money you spend that tells where your treasure is. I made a little short YouTube, a short Facebook clip and shared it. And hopefully y'all see those and share those and get the word out and people will hear about us and maybe come listen, who knows. Or it's just a little reminder for you about what we talked about the week before. But how does this work? I thought about this as I was making this video. I didn't give any great application for what this means. Because let's say you're giving away 50% of your income. I mean, that, that's huge. But what if you make $10 million a year? I mean, you're still living off $5 million, right? That's sort of my point in this, because you could be making 100000 and giving away 30000 but still live extravagantly and worldly. So we look at what you're spending and we say, well, are you living way out in some lavish, luxurious lifestyle and then justifying it by what you give, saying, well, I'm giving this so I can spend the rest on myself. Well, let's think about how this really plays itself out, okay? How does this work? There's two things two philosophies, if you will, you can take towards this statement I came up with after thinking about this. There's this philosophy, which I was my basis for it. I give more so I can spend more. That's one philosophy that people can have. Well, I'm gonna give more money so I can spend more on myself, okay? If I give, you know, I'm making a lot, so I'm gonna give a lot. That way, when I go buy this Rolex, I'm just trying to pick something no one else in here has, so don't offend anybody, you know. Uh, a Ferrari, you, oh, doggone it, Nathan's got a Rolex, like, uh, that'll be the day. <laughs> yeah, Christina's like, whatever. So, it, it, I give more so I can spend more. It's like justifying it by saying, hey, I just won the lottery, okay, or whatever. I'm gonna give $10 million away so I can buy myself 10 Ferraris. Or I'm going to give away X number of thousands so I can go buy myself, you know, something that's ridiculous, like a mink coat or something that was $10,000 or a Gucci bag or something that, you know, just something exorbitant. This is sort of what I'm talking about. I spend less so I can give more. This is the idea of, of John Wesley. And this is the idea where your spending really tells where your heart is. 
Because it's not really the giving that tells where your heart is. Because anyone can make a good show and dump large amounts of money into the offering plate. The point is, are you living at less than you have to so that you can give more? Do you ever make a choice to forego a pleasure of your own so that that money can go to someone else in need? Do you ever buy off-brand at Kroger <laughs> instead of name-brand? to save money on your grocery so you could give more. Do you make these decisions? This is what I'm talking about. It's not what you give that shows where your heart is, it's what you spend. Are you thinking about your purchases and saying, okay, I'm gonna take back a little bit of this so I can give more. I'm not gonna buy this nice of a car, I'm gonna buy less of a, of a car <laughs> so that I can give more away. This is the text I just mentioned. On the first day of every week, set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. This is exactly what, what I think is biblical about this idea. What you give should be in proportion to what you make. Instead of how it actually is, which it's sort of an inverse principle now, those who make the most give the least percentage-wise. You can't compare it dollar to dollar, okay? If, if I'm giving $5,000 a year, you can't compare yours to me and say that you're giving $7,000 a year if you make twice as much as I do. Okay, that, that doesn't work. If I'm giving 10%, but I only make $50,000 a year, you can't say because I make 100,000, I also should give 10%. What does that mean? That means that your standard of living is $90,000 a year, a year and mine's 45. So your standard of living is double what mine is? Does it really cost you twice as much to live your life as it does for me to live my life? Assuming we have the same family size, demographic, live in the same part of town, whatever. No, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that someone who makes a million dollars a year should only give 10%. That makes no sense at all. Because that means they can live off $900,000 a year. It makes no sense. In the eyes of Scripture, it should be in proportion to what you make. Uh, I'd have to look the book up, but it's called a biblical um, philosophy on stewardship. Anyway, some some crazy name. I, I read it. He talked. He taught this graduated tithe. The more you make, the higher percentage you should give. And after looking at all the texts in Scripture on giving, this is what I believe is a biblical principle. So as your income increases, the percentage you give must also increase or else you're just, in, you're just skyrocketing, rocketing, skyrocketing your standard of living and just giving a minuscule more to God. If it just stays at 10% and your income keeps going up and up and up like I just showed, someone who makes 100,000 can live off 90 at 10% and as you go up and up and up, your standard of living gets way bigger and what God gets doesn't get way bigger. It gets a little bigger, but that's not what I would consider a Luke 12. He who is rich should also be rich toward God and not build bigger barns for himself. So this is a graduated tithe. So the tithe graduates as your income graduates. As it goes up, your percentage goes up and up and up. Moving on. Relationships and marriage. We're going to spend some good time here. This is one of those areas where I think we can learn so much from Scripture, <laughs> of course, obviously, regarding money, but regarding our relationships. There's so much that the world has taught us incorrectly. One thing I mentioned last week I want to reemphasize is that the world... But not only the world, I've come up with this new term, Christian worldliness, okay? I, I, I just made that up, right? This is the world's mentality being voiced from Christian mouths. Christian worldliness has taught us that marriage is superior to singleness. It really has taught us this to the point where we feel like obligated to get married. And we feel like we have to teach our kids that the only proper way to grow up as a Christian is to find a nice Christian man or a Christian woman and to get married. It's almost like we don't even teach our kids the option of being celibate or of living a, a life of singleness to the Lord. We don't teach them equally. 
At least I haven't been. And it's, it, it's, and it's interesting because am I conditioning my children to think there's only one way that's proper for you to live your life for God, and that's to do what I did, and that's to get married and have kids. Some of that could be very selfish in that I want grandkids. A lot of times we like to skew our children in a direction that we went because of what we want, not because of what God wants for our children. And so we have to be very careful as we live and as we train our children that we pr produce some biblical justification for our teachings. And I think Paul and his example in Scripture and what he teaches, what we'll look at in 1 Corinthians 7, you should turn there now because we're going to read this text, tells us this truth. It's all caps because it's important. Kids. All of my kids and the teens, all of the unmarried people in the room, listen to me very carefully. Your worth is not defined by your marital status. Okay? Your worth is not defined by your marital status. The same way I went off on education last week saying that your worth is not defined by a degree or by letters at the end of your name or a college that you went to. Your worth is defined by who you are in the eyes of God in Jesus Christ. Okay? It's not defined by a boyfriend or a girlfriend. And believe me, I hear about the third grade drama already. It's, it's in... I, I'm not going to even say these things because they will be repeated by my third grader at school. So, <laughs> I've learned that lesson. Don't say it if you don't want it repeated at school to your daughter's friends. Um, your worth is not defined by your marital status. Now here's the text. Okay, let's look at it. 1 Corinthians 7, 27. Are you married? Do not seek a divorce. Are you unmarried? Do not look for a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. Okay? Right up, right up front. Nothing wrong with getting married. If a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life, and I want to spare you this. Any amens? From, no, no amens. No, stop. Don't do that, husbands. Your wives will not. <laughs> amen. Oh, troubles in life. No, don't, don't give me amens on that. 29. What I mean, brothers, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they had none. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who were happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. Great advice. Those who use the things of this world as if not engrossed in them. For this world in its present form is passing away. Don't be consumed with your status in this life, whether it's your husband or your wife that is your identity or your stuff. Your identity is not based on who you're married to or the fact that you are married. Your identity, again, is in Christ, so don't become too engrossed in the things of this world. He says, I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife, and his interests are divided. Scripture, Paul teaches, it's better not to be married, spiritually speaking. But that is a harder road to walk in this world. It is a road that you, when you pick, you choose, you choose to walk a harder road. Even though Paul says those who are married and lives face many struggles, I, I mean, I can't imagine being single my whole life. I mean, that, that sounds like a struggle. But look what Paul did. Paul did it. I know other men who've chosen to do that. Randy Harris is one I, I admire immensely for his choice to live a celibate life, to never get married, never pursue it, so that he could focus on his relationship with God. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I'm saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. Here is a biblical reality check. Okay? Biblical reality check. If you get married, that's good. If you remain single, that's better. 
That's the truth. Even though it might be more difficult emotionally, relationally, culturally to come home every holiday and have your family, have you met somebody? Have you found somebody? You're going to live by yourself the rest of your life? What do you think? Why haven't you met a nice girl? Why haven't you met a nice guy? Are you dating yet? Are you talking to anybody? And, and we just pour on this pressure. You got to be married. You got to be married. You got to be married. If someone chooses not to be, we should rejoice in that and count them as better off. Hopefully, they're using their singleness to exalt God in their lives and to live for Him. So ask yourself, these are a couple of the same questions from last time, but more specific. Do you view singleness as being inferior to being married? And this isn't just for you guys. I know you guys are married. This is also for people who will watch later online, and, and hopefully this will apply to many who aren't married. Do you feel like you need a spouse to complete you? This is one of those questions, again, for teens who are, who are getting into college and who are looking for that special person. But this is for you. Have you learned contentment as a single person? My best advice would be, if not, don't get married until you do. If you're choosing to get married, don't get married until you are content, completely content in who you are in Christ. Because if you don't and you start to build your life just on your spouse, then one day when that spouse is not there, everything else that is accompanying that codependency on that spouse will also come crashing down. We'll talk about that in just a second about how we build our spiritual lives, sometimes in dependency on our spouse. And when our spouse isn't there anymore, our spiritual life is also not there anymore. And so as a single person, you have to be content in your singleness before you pursue marriage. So talking about marriage now, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Think about this in marriage, okay? I'm applying this specifically to married people now. Each of you, husbands, should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of your wives, of your wife. Each of you wives, <laughs> yeah, I know, I said that in plural. I was like, that could be taken wrong. Each of you, all of you, you all, should look not only to your own interests as a wife, but also to the interests of your husband. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Husbands, are you, are you Jesus in your home? Wives, are you Jesus in your home? In a minute, we'll talk to the kids, and I'll ask you kids. Kids, are you Jesus in your home? You're called to have the attitude of Jesus in your home. The point of what Paul is saying in Philippians is this. Are we serving out of reciprocity? That's a big word. Kids, be glad I didn't put the underline under reciprocity. Okay, I put it under sacrifice. Much easier word to spell. So let's ask ourselves, husbands, do we serve out of what we can get out of our service? Do we serve because we are waiting for our wife to repay the favor? Do we do the dishes because we want something from our wives do we do the laundry because we think we'll get something in return wives same question do you serve out of reciprocity are you serving out of a reciprocal i serve you you serve me mentality i'll do this for you if you do this for me i'll do this for you you do this for me and we've built this household where it's i will continue my end of the deal as long as you continue your end of the deal you choose to not do your chores for a week, I'll show you that I won't do mine for a week either. Or do we serve out of sacrifice? Am I really serving my spouse out of a desire to be Jesus to her with no need for anything in return? In fact, if she goes through a week and doesn't want to do any of her chores or whatever, I'll do them all. And I won't hold it against her. Because I serve out of sacrifice. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm saying that. Don't think I got this down, guys. Don't even think for a second I've got this down. I'm saying what I'm trying to do, what I want to be, 
is Jesus. And if I have to do them all, I will. Because I'm not, I'm not serving out of what I can get out of the relationship. I'm serving because I'm Jesus in the house. And that's what the wives should also be doing for the husband. Honestly, there should be arguments over who gets to do the most service in the home. Your kids, I mean, when they're wanting to serve, that's how we want to raise our children. To where they come to us and say, what can I do, Dad? What can I do to help clean the house? What can I do to help you? And that's the same way that husbands and wives should act together. So let's go a little bit deeper. You're like, that's deep enough, Paul. I've got enough to work on the rest of my life. I don't need any more to add to it. Well, sorry. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. I don't even have time to get into the depth of the comparison of the husband-wife relationship to Christ and the church. But we have to understand, wives, that you are not equal to your husband. Just the same as we as a church are not equal to Christ. We don't have the same significance in, in the scheme of the world that Christ did. Christ is the head of the church. Whatever Christ says, the church does. And hopefully, if your husband is Christ in your home, whatever your husband says, you can do. The problem with this idea of submission where it breaks down is where our husbands aren't being Christ. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That should be a blank on your paper, so write that down. I can't even get into the depth of this statement either. But husbands, lay down your lives for your wives. Take up your cross for your wife. Die to yourself every day for your wife. Just as Christ died for you, just as Christ loved the church and died for the church, husbands, that's what you do for your wives. So husbands, specifically, I'm talking to you now, then I'll talk to the wives. Husbands, ask yourself, is your wife dependent on you or dependent on Christ? Meaning, am I developing my wife in a way, spiritually, that she is looking to Christ, not to me, for her satisfaction, for her, the things that she needs? Am I helping her have an eternal perspective and not build her life just on me? And obviously, as a husband-wife team, we are dependent on each other to a degree. But I don't want to create dependency on myself when I should be helping her look to Jesus and be dependent on him, leading her to pray instead of trying to pray her prayers for her. And I don't mean that you actually do that. What I actually mean is that we try to be the spiritual leader and just drag our family along with us spiritually instead of trying to help them build their own relationships with God. Next, if you died today, would your wife's spiritual life come crashing to the ground? Okay, this is like spiritual life insurance. This is a question that every husband and wife, both ways, more so the husband, should ask yourself. Have I prepared, this is so morbid and so disturbing, I know, I'm sorry, but you have to ask this question, especially as you grow older. Am I preparing my wife to be a widow, a spiritual widow who honors God by the way she lives and who in the loss of me can be an example to other people about someone whose life is dependent on Christ? Because it happens all too often when, when the husband is gone It's just utter, utter, I mean, it's just a disaster spiritually. And it shouldn't be that way. Yes, there should be mourning. There should be healthy mourning. There should be sadness. There should be grieving. Yes, all of those things are healthy. 
but it should be in such a way that isn't why God, it should be, God, you blessed me with a husband for however many years I got to have him. Praise you, praise God for what I had. Now, God, help me mourn through this process. And so it's one of those things where we have to be thinking, I won't be there forever. Is my wife prepared to be a spiritual guide to my children or even just for herself when I'm gone? Yeah, let me repeat that so everyone can hear. Um, Julie's question is excellent. Do you love your spouse more than you love God? And that also applies to your parents as well. Do you love your parents more than you love God? Because I know that that is something that we came face to face with just in our lives. And it's a great question to ask yourself of your spouse, because if you do love your spouse more than you love God, that's going to create a lot of conflict in the instance that, that you lose them. And so there's this mystery almost that Julie was referring to where we can go through life together and always say, yes, we love God more. But then in a, in a reality check, in a heart check, you come to realize, wow, I think I did love my mom more than I loved Jesus, or I did love my spouse more than I loved Jesus. So that's a great question to be asking yourself. How much more holy is your wife because she is married to you? How much holier, I should have put holier instead of how much more holy, but anyway. How much holier is your wife because she is married to you? This, this goes down to the core of, of discipling, of husbands leading our wives like Christ would lead the church. And Christ, when he had disciples following him, he led those disciples in a way that made them holy and prepared them to lead the church prepared them to be spiritually independent. And husbands, we need to lead our wives so that they have their own spiritual life. Now, we also have one together, yes, but they also have their own. And I could get into a lot more detail. I won't go there. But your wife should be a better person because she's married to you. You should challenge her and her holiness. Now, let's talk to parents, okay? Talk to parents, and I'm going to talk to children in just a second. The line, the blank, is are we worldly parents or biblical parents? That's the question. Are we worldly parents or biblical parents? Ephesians gives us this instruction. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. That means frustrate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. I'm going to go from here and I'm going to ask you some questions. Okay, so this is parents, both mo mothers and fathers, because some of you, some of us will be a, almost a single parent spiritually in the family. Hopefully we're working together, but some mothers or single, single mothers will watch this. And yes, this applies to you as a single mother or a single father. But as parents, let's ask ourselves some very hard questions. First, how often do you open your Bible with your kids? How often do you open your Bible with your kids? That, that's a big deal. It's a big deal as well when you study your Bible privately that you use a real Bible so that your kids can see you reading the Bible. Parents, it is so important that your kids and even grandkids see you reading a Bible. And guess what? A phone doesn't look like a Bible. Neither does an iPad. That can be great if you are on, on your own and you can you do that and be disciplined and ignore all the notifications. And if someone calls, decline it. And if someone texts, just push it up. And if someone interrupts you, just push it to the side. And yeah, like that's the way we should study our Bibles. But your kids should see you holding a Bible. And you should open it with your kids. How often do you put spiritual things above social events, sports, employment in your family? And employment in your family. How often do you put spiritual things above your job or above your kids' sports or above social events? I talked about this a little bit last week, so I'll leave that there. 
This one too. Are you as concerned about your kids' knowledge of God as you are about their schoolwork? I would say that it's hard. That's a hard question because I want my kids to succeed in school. And I have this, this desire, this pride even, when my kids do well in school. And I also want them to do well in the Word. And I need to care more about how they do in the Word than I do about how they do at school. And it's not always that way. Are we teaching our kids that our Christianity counts on Monday through Saturday? This is a tough question, parents. But are we living the Christian life out on Monday through Saturday? So are they not just seeing us open our Bibles? Are they seeing us talking about the Word, impressing it on our children? You can see where this is about to go in a second. Talking about it when they get up and when they go to bed. Writing it on the door frames of our house. Tying it on our foreheads and bind, binding it on our foreheads and tying it on our hands and those things. And do we want our kids copying our spiritual lives and disciplines? It's a hard question. Do I want my kid copying the way I live? Because you should. You should say, yes, I want my kid to be disciplined spiritually like I am. I want them to have the spiritual life that I have. I don't want to be one of those people who say, I know they'll do better than me. I know they'll do, they'll, they won't make the same mistakes I did. They'll do better than me. No. Odds are they'll repeat the same mistakes you repeat if you don't train them differently. And so they'll be the same as you spiritually if you don't train them differently. That's why Deuteronomy, this is the text I just sort of referred to. Right after the Shema, which is the hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commands that I give you today that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. I stutter when I talk really fast. Referring to these commandments, impress them on your children. Okay, impress them. Like literally, I'm pushing these commandments into my child, making an impression on my child. I'm going to talk about them when I sit at home and when I walk along the road, when I drive along the road, when I lie down, when I get up. I'm going to be talking about the Word of God. I'm going to tie them as symbols on my hands and bind them on my forehead. And so we don't really wear scripture that much. But when you have an opportunity to wear something that's Christian, I mean, that's a good way, again, to show your kids about it. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. One thing I don't think God would have a problem with us is, is decorating our homes in scripture. Don't think that that is going to be a problem. Children, now I'm going to talk to the children. Obey your parents in the Lord. So kids, back row, my kids, all the kids, pay attention, okay? This is the part of the sermon for the kids and the teens, don't worry. Didn't forget about the teens. I know you guys are over there. So this is for you. I've talked to the husbands, the wives, the single people, the parents, now the children. Obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. Meaning, it's the first out of the Ten Commandments that a promise is added to it. Go look at the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. You'll see all the commandments, and then you get to the honor your father and mother. It's the first one in the list of ten that comes with a promise. That it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. So kids, teens, kids, ask yourself these questions. These are for you. Okay? First... Are you focused on living out your Christianity at home? Are you focused on being a Christian in your home? Do you think about it? Do you think, okay, I'm a Christian, I'm a child, and I need to act like a Christian? Because it's easy as a kid to get into your routine and to just do whatever you want, however you want, not think about the fact, well, now I'm a Christian, I need to live like it. I asked you this question a second ago, kids. Kids. Are you serving your family as Christ would? Are you holding yourself to that Philippians 2, 5? Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And Philippians 2, later on, do everything without complaining or arguing. Next. Do you think about your needs only, or do you think about the other people in your home as well? 
How often, kids, do you think about serving your siblings and say, I'm going to serve my sibling? Not out of reciprocity. That's a big word you learned today. What it means is I do something hoping to get something out of it. Reciprocal is where it comes from. I do it and they do something for me. I do for them, they do for me. No, I serve, period. Are you being Christ in your home? How often do you complain versus saying thank you when things don't go your way? Best example of this, when Brooklyn took karate, she had a karate teacher who would play games uh, with them at the end of class, and she required every kid who lost the game to say thank you before they walked off the floor. So they were playing the game, the kid got eliminated, thank you, sir, or thank you, ma'am, and they walked off. I said, that is awesome. Something doesn't go your way. Can I have this? No, thank you. Oh, can I do this? No, you can't, thank you. Oh, I'd like to have this, can I have this? No, I'm sorry, you can't, thank you. Whatever it is, you get punished, thank you. That's a tough one. Are our families living for this life or the next? When we bring all these questions down to their summary, are our families living for this life or the next? Do we have an eternal perspective or are we living for this world? Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And I, honest to goodness, can't remember if I left those blanks up there by accident or if that's actually a blank this week again as it was last week. It's not? Okay. So that was from last week. Wait a second. What about friendships? We all have friends, right? Last type of relationship to deal with. How many of your friendships are built on Christ? I'm going to read you three texts, and we're going to end with this. I don't have time to get to that last section. I'm going to have to bump it till next week. Because if I try to rush, I'm not going to do a good job, and I'm not going to go there. So we're going to end with this section on friendship. I'm going to read you three texts that describe friendships. And I'm going to ask you if you have any friends that are Ecclesiastes 4, John 15, or James 5 friends. First, Ecclesiastes 4. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Someone there to help me through my, my, my struggles, through my trials. John 15. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. Greater love has no man or no one than this that he lay down his life for his friends. Better way to translate it would be, no one has greater love than that he lay down his life for his friends. That would make more sense. James 5, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. So friends, all of you are friends to someone you have a friend, so ask yourself these questions. First, do you have any Ecclesiastes 4, John 15, or James 5 friends? Okay, A friend who will pick you up when you fall. A friend that you would die for. Die for. And a friend that you confess your sins to. Friend who will pick you up if you fall. Friend who you would die for. And a friend that you would confess, that you do confess your sins to. Here's a good question. How often do you study the Word of God with a friend? We talk about spiritual lives at home, with our spouses, with our kids. Well, it also transcends that. How often do you study the Word of God with a friend? Just get together and you're like, hey, let's read the Bible together. Do any of your friends know your spiritual struggles? So this goes along with confessing your sins. But do any of your friends know the things that you struggle with spiritually? 
Like if you're going through a hard time and you're depressed, like does anyone, do you have anyone you would talk to about that and say, hey, I'm going through a really hard time spiritually right now. You start doubting maybe that God is listening to your prayers or that he's there or you don't know about, you know, the kind of decisions you're going to make with this or that. You don't know if you're being a good parent. Spiritually speaking, who, who would you talk to about that? How many of your friends would you die for? Okay, some of these are redundant from number one. I guess I'm sort of illustrating. Do any of your friends know your spiritual struggles would be Ecclesiastes 4. How many of your friends would you die for would be a John 15. And how many of your friends do you pray with, not pray for, would sort of be a James 5, confess your sins to each other. What I mean by pray for, I mean, it's not just your friend says, will you pray for me? And you say yes, and then you go home and pray for them. Your friend says, will you pray for me? And you pray for them right then. Or you have a time when you actually pray with your friends. You have prayer time together. Which of your friends do you go to for spiritual advice? That's a good question. Are we building friendships of people with people that we would want their advice on a spiritual matter? Kids, teens, ask yourself that question. Who, who among your peer group would you go to for spiritual advice? Anybody? Does anyone of your peers live such a life that you would go to them for spiritual advice? I hope so. Are you that person? That's an even better question. Are you the person that people come to for spiritual advice? Because that's who you want to be. That's who you want to be. To which of your friends do you confess your sins? So there we go, James 5. You have a lot of friends. <laughs> question mark? Do you? Do you have a lot of friends? Like maybe. I don't. I don't have a lot of friends. I've got, I've got friends. How many of them help you love and obey God? Wow, that's a tough one. Especially as a teenager or a kid, how many of your friends are saying, would God want us to do this? Would God be pleased if, if we did this or if we went and said that or went there or did that? Or... And same with us as adults. How many of our friends are helping us love and obey God? That's huge. Those are the kind of friends that we want. Now, we need to have friends in the world, obviously, because we need to have evangelistic opportunities to share the gospel with others. But you should not be a single Christian in a world of worldly friends. It's a very lonely place to be. You need to have your church family, and hopefully that's something that we will help build here and in the mornings as well. But be friends. That's what I want our church to be, especially our morning church, our house church. I want that to be a group of friends who help each other love and obey God and who do these kinds of things for each other. There's a text in, in 1 John that says, this is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. I put those words in brackets. So watch what happens when we change that one little word to be drive. Whoever claims to live in him must drive as Jesus would. It's, it's, it's true. If Jesus was here today, he probably, I don't know if he would have a car or not. It might be like a 1991 Honda Civic or something. Um, but who knows? That would be weird to even think about. Um, one prosperity preacher said if Jesus was around today, he would, he would fly in a, in a Gulf Stream. And he only said that because he wanted his church to buy him a $30 million Gulfstream jet. Anyway, so anyone who claims to live in Christ must drive as Jesus did. And what we face a lot is that the culture has polluted us, polluted the way Christians act regarding acceptable sins. Okay? Acceptable sins, meaning breaking the law. Just because everyone else breaks the law doesn't make it right. And so we really have to be challenged in the way we drive. The Babylon Bee had this great article called Retractable Christian Fish Bumper Decal Now Available. I thought this was hilarious because he said in the article, want to cut someone off but worried you'll be a bad witness. Now you can slap the red button on your dashboard and a small panel will rotate on your bumper hiding the fish from view. 
a company spokesperson said. Flip people off on the freeway, gun down the shoulder during a traffic jam, all without worrying about marring the good name of Christ. And you push the little button and the, your Christian bumper sticker goes away. It's insane. But very funny. So think about this. Romans 2 says, You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? How about this? You who preach against speeding, do you speed? You who say that people should not commit adultery or not break the law, do you break the law? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who brag about the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. So our last set of questions. Do you consistently break the law because everyone else does? Question two, does your driving change when a police officer is nearby or behind you? Is this not a sign that we are living in error? What if your behavior behind the wheel was displayed on a TV in front of the entire church? That's a tough one. That was from last week. Now this is the new stuff. I want you to think about me time. We all love me time. I want some me time today. And when we don't have our me time, we're angry. I didn't get any me time today. You know? I'm sorry, maybe that's just me. Maybe that's just me and my me time. Think about your me time. I love taking these texts and applying them to my recreational time, my private time. Uh, my private behaviors, meaning the things that I do when it's just me, I have free choice, there's no one expecting me to do anything, it's just me and my me time. Whatever I do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. And whether you eat or drink or whatever you do for your me time, do it all for the glory of God. Do it all for the glory of God. Ask yourself, how do you act when no one else is around? No one's around. No one's going to know what you do. No one's going to know if you binge watch some Game of Thrones nonsense for five hours. Heaven help us if that's what we're doing with our time. Just because Game of Thrones should be banned. Anyway, what do you do when no one else is around? What kinds of behaviors do you do? What are the kinds of things that you read about? The things that you watch? The things that you... I'll, I'll be honest, when I was by myself, I would watch rated R movies. That was my thing. Okay, because I knew Julie didn't like all the blood and guts and everything. I was like, oh, I'm by myself. I'll rent one of these violent rated R movies. Then I realized, I was like, the things that I'm doing when I'm by myself are not glorifying to God. So I have to be more aware of how I spend my me time to know that what I'm doing when no one else is around is still being seen in the eyes of God and it still needs to be glorifying to Him. Romans 6, 17-23, the main point of the text is what I'm illustrating here on the screen. It says, just as you used to, and I added in the parentheses, well, before you were a Christian, you used to spend your free time offering the parts of your body into slavery, to impurity, and to ever-increasing wickedness. So now, now that you're a Christian, spend your free time offering the parts of your body in slavery to righteousness leading to holiness. Do you spend your free time, your me time, in activities that promote holiness? Or are you wasting it? on YouTube. No eye contact, I'm not looking at anybody. <laughs> Ask yourself, what do you do when no one else is home? What kinds of TV shows do you watch when no one else is around? Like I'd never watch this with my friends, but when I'm by myself I'll watch this, as long as no one knows what I'm watching. How much time is wasted on video games? If you have an hour to kill, how do you kill it? Exactly. <laughs> if you have an hour to kill, how do you kill it? Like, are you doing things that are glorifying to God, or are you literally killing an hour, like mutilate, like, anyway. 
Does your private time bring you closer to God and cr or create a desire for more worldliness? So ask yourself, are the things that you're feeding in your private time developing holiness or are they creating a desire for more worldliness? Because those are the things that we need to think about. <laughs> Can you say, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ? Can you stand before your kids? Husbands, can you stand before your wives? Wives, can you stand before your husbands and say, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ? The only way we can do this is through the Spirit. You can't kill your sin without His Spirit. We have to be dependent on the Spirit to become less like the world and more like Jesus.